This is the first part of a reverse engineering lab that I'm teaching at TU Darmstadt this semester. So there's a recording also on YouTube because many people asked me if they could follow this. But of course, the in-person experience is missing when you're watching this on YouTube. Still, there are some exercises that you can also do at home. So how do you even become a reverse engineer? Well, I'm Jiska and I'm terrible at writing code, but that also means that I'm really good at reading terrible code because I have to read my own code a week later or sometimes a semester later. And also because I'm good at writing terrible code, I think it's totally fine to write some assembly snippets and embed them into JavaScript just to hook some existing binary. And I really prefer that to writing something from scratch. So really reverse engineering something, modifying something is much easier for me than writing a large application on my own. So trust me, I'm an engineer. And yeah, these are my recommendations, so to say. And well, how to become a reverse engineer, the second part. I think during my bachelor and master that I had like a lot of theory and they included system designs, but yeah, so I didn't implement much, but at least I saw many things, how they work and how they are supposed to work. And this means that I'm also good at guessing how a complete system looks like, even when I'm only given small piece of information. And another important skill for reverse engineering is that all the exams that I wrote, they trained me to remember some unnecessary details or things that really don't make sense, but just remember them. And then a few months later, or just a few weeks later, just putting this together and find a place like where this information fits and suddenly things make sense. Reverse engineering is something that really needs a lot of patience. The learning curve is very steep and in the beginning you will just stare onto something. You won't understand what it does. You just stare into the void. And then at some point in time you remember enough and you have sufficient information to yeah, suddenly get a bigger picture. And then you find a bug, you understand how a certain component works with another, how data is being parsed and processed. So yeah, you really need just patience and yeah, probably a good memory to do this. Another thing is, so probably there's some CTF players watching this, um, who are really good at things, but then again, there are probably also some beginners in here and actually simple tricks might already do the job. So maybe you wrote a very complicated tool that is good for finding bugs. But in the end, just writing a simple puzzle that just you get some input, you change a few bits with random data or something, you just flip bits and you find bugs already. Um, and that might probably be faster at finding bugs than a very complicated technique. So next to the goals of this project or lab. You are here to get familiar with dynamic and static reverse engineering methods. So that's the reason why you attend or watch this video. And you want to use this probably for security analysis, maybe also for re-implementing an interface or something. And then in the end, you want profit maybe. Now, the thing is when you're doing this for security research, there's no, so to say, bug guarantee. So some bugs are really, really trivial. That means, for example, in FaceTime, there was a bug. You just could add yourself to a call and then call someone else. And this meant you could hear their audio before they even pick up the call. And this sounds like a very simple bug, but it's very hard to find such a bug automated. And that means also like in a program, if you don't know that there is going to be a bug, then there is no guarantee that you find it. And some people look uh, into a program doing their bachelor or master thesis for a whole semester or even longer, and they still don't find anything. And that means that the grading here will not be based on, wow, you got this and that many CVEs or something, but mainly on the methods that you use. So if you have 
interesting testing methods and make a lot of progress there and you doc document like what you did and how you did it and why this is the important part so just reason about what you wanted to do what was your goal um, and even if you don't find something you can say okay i tested the following things and my target was secure i mean that happens just try to do something different and interesting The more to attend this lab is actually, uh, yeah, there's multiple versions. So you can either participate in a six credit point lab or nine credit point. There's also a few people here attending this for doing a bachelor or uh, internship. So uh, first of all, if you're in a lab, that's probably the best mode to choose if you're new to reverse engineering. So you want to learn it, you want to invest some time and maybe you want to find your first bug or even a few of them, but yeah, just look into something small as a beginner and that's totally fine. But maybe you also want to do a project. That's probably better if you already played some CTFs, you have some experiences, like this is not completely new to you, but probably you have never done this like over a six month period of time. And really you want to invest some time on hunting a bunch of bugs or implementing an interesting tool, uh, re-implementing a closed source thing in the open source, for example. And something that university requires is for a nice CP project, you also have to do project management. So you have to provide a detailed project plan, like what you want to do. And you should also, if it's possible, like if you're working on a very large project, also manage maybe like two or three people who work on something together with you. And you can mix this. So if one person wants to be like the project manager and do a project together with normal lab students, that's also fine. And then there's the third mode. So some of you are here to do this as a bachelor thesis or internship. And that means that, uh, well, there is more time investment on your side. And also you need to do detailed reporting, which means you actually write an internship report or you actually write a thesis in the end and not just like, a few presentations and on the other hand so there are some presentation dates you don't have to participate in them if you're doing a bachelor thesis but there are some presentations where you could profit from so for example there is one where you can present like your attacker model and maybe um, discuss if there are further yeah attack vectors or something that you didn't see so i would recommend to at least participate in some of them but it's not recommended yeah, and again, especially for a thesis, you should find a structured way of testing things. So reason why you did what, maybe compare like the things that you did to security guides, and then you can say they are incomplete or they are really correct or something. And just try to make it not just a pen test report, but really think a bit on your own. I have a bunch of thesis examples. So even if you're not doing this as a thesis, just to have an idea about how reverse engineering works and what you can find with this, I can recommend you to look into this. The first one is Aristoteles, which is about the IOS baseband interface, and it has a special protocol that Tobias analyzed for his bachelor thesis. And he worked a lot with Ghidra. So it's also nice to see some Ghidra scripting, for example, in a thesis. Then there is another one about the Bluetooth stack on macOS um, that is needed to implement uh, an internal blue version that works on macOS, which is just, it's a Bluetooth firmware tool. And the initial Bluetooth firmware tool development was a master thesis by Dennis Manz. So this one is a lot about bare metal firmware and yeah, how to find parts of an operating system that you don't know how it works so real-time operating system in a firmware and stuff like this so it's also really interesting and then based on this knowledge there is Sian who built a firmware emulator so to find even more bugs in the firmware he did fuzzing and emulation and there is another one um, toothpicker which is um, it's about fuzzing the Bluetooth ecosystem on iOS and, and macOS, so like just very um, Apple specific stuff and also AirPods. And he also explains a lot about 
yeah, vendor specific protocols. So protocols that are only used by Apple and how to understand what they do. So it's also an interesting thesis to read. Also a good overview about uh, wireless things uh, by Apple. The next part of this lecture is about the organization. So if you're watching this just on YouTube and not in person, then probably you can skip this part. First of all, Darmstadt has a bunch of COVID rules. Please wear an FFP2 mask during the lab and I will also check your 3G status. Currently there's a rule that allows presenters to take off masks, but if we have presentation days where like every student is a presenter, then this mask doesn't make any sense. So everyone would not wear a mask. So it's a good idea that we just all wear a mask. If you feel sick or you had a high risk contact, so for example, you're currently living in the same household with a person who is positive or something, then please just don't attend and you don't have to prove this. So you just write me a message like, Hey, Yiska, I cannot attend today or something like this. And then I just know that you won't be there. For this reason, all introductory lectures are recorded like this one that you're watching and all the presentations that later on are used for your grading have PDF hands in. So if you miss a presentation, you just upload the PDF. And if you cannot pre present it in person, then we find a way to present it either the week later or for example, you can do this via, for example, Big Blue Button or something, some video conferencing system, uh, or you upload a recording of the presentation instead of doing this in person. Another thing that's important to talk about is coordinated disclosure. So it might happen that you find critical bugs. And with critical bugs, I don't mean like, oh, yeah, you're application is, I don't know, not perfect and does this and that, and you should improve this. But I mean, really critical bug that a vendor should fix as soon as possible. So for example, a critical bug is when it's exploitable remote. So you don't have to have a physical IOT device for this, but you can like over the internet, all IOT devices or all smartphones that are connected to a service or something. Uh, and this also means it affects many users. So these are the two parts for something to be critical in my opinion. And an example would be if you can retrieve precise locations of all iCloud user iPhones, that's a privacy breach, that's pretty huge. Or for example, if you find a one click remote code execution bug in Chrome, that's also critical. So if you find a bug of this type, then please just report it as soon as possible to the vendor. You can just directly report it to the vendor if you're experienced with reporting. Maybe you're just a bit like not sure or something or you want my assistance. Then we can also talk about this directly either in person if there's like a few days later a lab meeting, that's okay. But otherwise you can also send me encrypted email or signal through my messages. So we can just keep in contact about this. But you don't have to send it to me. So I'm happy if I don't have such bugs in my inbox and they just get fixed and I never like really hear about this until they are fixed. And this also means please keep those bugs confidential and also bugs that we talk about in the lab. And if bugs are really critical, then we might just skip them from the presentations so that we don't have a large group of students that knows about them and they are, yeah, they just exist and they get fixed. And maybe in the end of the lab, you can just talk about this because it's already being fixed. And such bugs also tend to give you a bug bounty. So if you get a bug bounty, you are allowed to keep it. You're just a student of TU Darmstadt. So you're not really hired or something. And so it's your choice what you do with the bounty. The lectures are all in our IT security building downstairs. You're probably already there or you know where it is uh, if you uh, are at TU Darmstadt. And I so far blocked seven lecture presentation dates. But if you want, I can also book additional dates so that we just meet a bit more informal for some question answer sessions or something. Or for example, uh, we have a student lab upstairs that you can also use if you want. 
The time schedule has two parts. So first, I want to get you started very fast. So kind of teach you reverse engineering. And then there is a hands-on period where you do stuff on your own. And during this reverse engineering bootcamp, so to say, there's weekly lectures and you also have to work quite a lot. So today is the reverse engineering basics introduction. And you also have to write a project proposal by the end of this week so that I can already like see what you want to work on and maybe even order some hardware that I will hand out as soon as early, uh, as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, so there's also then a lecture that's more technical about Frida and Gitra in that week. In the next week, you already think about what are, yeah, attack vectors and stuff that, uh, yeah, depending on, on the application that you're looking into, might apply or not apply and so on. So this is the bootcamp just to yeah get you started. And then later on, um, there are fewer deadlines. So you will have to do a few presentations in between, but we also just have some Q&A sessions. So the idea is just that you are working on it. You ask questions, maybe in the forum, maybe in person and we just stay on track and you also have some time to learn for exams in between. And now to the legal background, of course, everyone just wants to hack and don't want, you don't want to hear about legal things, but I think it's pretty important because especially reverse engineering, it's really a gray zone and many things are illegal or at least not explicitly allowed. So disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm just giving you a few hints what to take care about and not everything is like, yeah, 100% allowed or disallowed just because there's also, yeah, missing regulations, court decisions, at least in Germany. So this is just, yeah. <laughs> some some to give you some idea like what you can do what you cannot do and where you should just yeah try to yeah avoid those situations and really try to avoid trouble so even if you are doing something that's legal and even like later you see each other in court and it's decided that what you did is legal this is still a very long process and it costs your time, your money. Uh, and yeah, so sometimes people just react in weird ways. So for example, there has been recently the case where someone only looked at the source code of a website. And I mean, the source code of a website, you just get it at the moment you visit the website, it's downloaded to your computer. It's like nothing that's super suspicious or I, I don't know, it's really not complex to look at the source code of a website. You just press F12 for web development, all browsers support this. <laughs> so no idea, but uh, the governor of Missouri just thought like, okay, this has to be illegal and uh, tried to file a court case against someone who informed them about uh, that the website source code had private information in it. So everyone tried to be good but still like people were mistaken, didn't understand the technology behind this. And in the end, in court, it was decided that this was legal. Still, <laughs> you just don't want to end up in such a situation. Then in Germany, it's also not so simple. And Basically, what is written here in German, of course, because it's about German law, is that uh, it's a gray zone. So reverse engineering only had a few decisions in court and uh, some things are allowed, some aren't, and some stuff is not really at least publicly decided, so to say. So it's really hard to, to tell what is legal and what not. Um, so for example, in this case, some security researchers, they just looked into a tool or like something that is put into apps to make them secure. And they analyzed if this tool that should make things secure is really making things secure, like if it is secure or not. So really just security of a security product. And the only way 
to do this, to like see if security claims of a vendor hold, they have to reverse engineer it. And then the company just saw that they did this. And instead of saying, yeah, thank you for telling us that our approach is not secure, they instead just said, okay, here's an injunction and you are never allowed to reverse engineer again. And <laughs> of course, that's nothing that you want to get as a security researcher. And also one thing about this is that um, the, this injunction was only against the students. So probably the company expected that the students don't have any yeah, legal insurance or something, but they didn't uh, file it against the professors in this case. So there is some stuff that is allowed. So for example, it is allowed that you test and look at a program or like view it while it is running. And you can even probably do debugging. So there's also some literature that says it's, yeah, you can do this. And then disassembling is already so, so. So disassembling means that you have machine code instructions and say what it is in assembly. But that's something that like, if you're very trained, you can even already read um, like a binary and the hex numbers and you know which instructions they are in machine code and what it means. But it's yet another step before decompilation and decompilation is really an issue because decompilation means that um, you try to reconstruct the original source code and this is a copyright issue here. So this is something that you are not allowed to do. So you can probably disassemble, but you cannot decompile. Also the issue is like a debugger can usually disassemble. So this, this reads easy if you say like these are the paragraphs that say yes or no, but there is many tools that do like stuff somewhere in between and uh, then like maybe you are allowed to like fix a bug or something to yeah still try to i don't know uh fi fix a bug in a program you need to reverse engineer it uh but sometimes it's also it's for example allowed if you want interoperability between different programs and stuff so there's stuff that's allowed then again it's disallowed so it's it's really not easy. Then there's another thing that's allowed. For example, you can uh, do some black box testing. So that might be a thing that you're allowed to do again. Still just showing this to you to see that it's, it's a real complicated situation. And still I'm offering a reverse engineering lab. So there are still some ways to do this, but really be aware that there's many things that you shouldn't do. And then every country has different rules. So what I just told is about Germany in the United States, there is a whole bunch of different laws and the EFF just collected them. I think EFF does a really great job there. They also have some recommendations like when you want to do reverse engineering, what should you take care about, which laws apply and so on. Now, one of the reasons why we can do reverse engineering for security research is that some companies say we have exceptions. So for example, Apple says we are not going to um, sue any uh, reverse engineer if they did the reverse engineering to report a bug to us and participate in the bounty. But here they say it's the actions that they were performed by a good faith security research and like what is this? What is good faith? Like, because I'm working for university, am I good faith? If I wouldn't, am I still good faith? So it's just, ah, what was the intention when doing reverse engineering? It's always pretty hard to like really prove this. Then Tesla, for example, also has an exception and they say that they are not claiming any copyright violation if you do security research. And also like if you have an issue with your test lines on they they will just support you doing security research. But again, they say good faith security researcher and so on. <laughs> so it's still the same vague terms here. 
In some countries you even have exceptions. So this one is from Australia and there are research exceptions. So just try to look at the target that you have and see if what you're planning to do is allowed or not. If the company has a bug bounty program, if the bug bounty program even explicitly says you're allowed to do reverse engineering, these are all good things to, to look for. And then, for example, if you do malware reverse engineering, that's also a thing because nobody will claim authorship for malware. And it's also not the easiest to style with, so probably not a good thing for this lab because malware, of course, has built-in reverse engineering mitigation. It might detect it's running in a virtual machine. It might detect a debugger is attached. Um, so it's probably something that when you master it, then you can get interesting and well-paid jobs, but uh, you have to get to this level and it's really not the thing that you do to enter reverse engineering. Another thing to look for is previous security research. So, for example, the company that has the product that you're looking at uh, maybe has some publications or there are publications about their products and you can just look for this. And you should try to avoid to be the first person who reports something. So if you don't find any report, then probably nobody has ever reported something before. Or even worse, so far they just managed to yeah, try to tell the researchers not to publish their results and that's really not what you want. So in, in both cases, so either it's nothing public because they avoided any publications or if it's the first report then often it causes a lot of chaos and uncertainty. So the company does not know how to handle a security incident. And then they ask the legal department and they say like, oh, hmm, someone did a security analysis where they on a system they were not allowed to. And then you see each other in court instead of having the bug fixed. And then also if you can, so if there are public reports, try to see if there's a security reporting timeline. Because the company just might be known that, yeah, they take long to apply patches and maybe they also try to yeah, make the researchers sign an NDA so that they can no longer talk about what they did. And on the right hand side, you can just see one example disclosure timeline for Broadcom Wi-Fi firmware. And you see that this goes, so it's very small font, but it goes like from September 2018 until April 2019, just from like sending an email to Broadcom until being yeah, allowed to blog post about this. And I think they did, so to say, everything right. Um, at least they, they went like the official ways that you have to do when you really want to publish something without uh, having any risk about the publication. One more thing here is availability. So uh, if you cause service disruption on a remote server, that could be very expensive for the company that you're disrupting. So you could also be liable for this. And of course you don't have like any allowance, like you are not allowed to just test any system on the internet. So you shouldn't cause like denial of service and probably already simple tests and scans might cause a denial of service on a remote system. And also don't try to modify or retrieve massive amounts of data from remote servers and just, yeah, try to avoid remote servers, try to look into a local app. And I mean, you cannot really do reverse, reverse engineering on a remote server anyway. You want to look into something with a debugger and that's usually like local. And here's a very nice blog post, uh, again, about hacking Apple. And in this uh, case, it's about CloudKit. And the researcher just found a deletion function. And instead of just like reporting to Apple, hey, I found a deletion function, does it work unauthorized? Can you please test it? They just, they, they just, yeah, they tried it on their own if they could delete some data and then suddenly all Apple shortcuts were deleted uh, from all iCloud accounts. So um, that's probably not what they expected when testing it. Um, and also Apple said like, yeah, please don't test live on our service the next time. But then again, 
probably if the researcher would have just reported like there is this API call, can you try it? Then it might not have been fixed or Apple would have just fixed it silently and there would not be a proof that this actually works server side. So yeah, server side stuff is always weird and yeah, idly just don't touch it. The next part here is user privacy. And that's again, something, especially when working on remote service is an issue. And data leakage is like really, really complex to report. All affected users have to be informed. Even if you as a security researcher saw their data, it's still a third party person who saw it and accessed it. So that's really a problem here. So avoid accessing data from users that you don't know. And ideally just create test accounts. So sometimes you have an app that mostly runs on a smartphone, for example, but you still need to have some user accounts. So just create all the user accounts on your own. And then you can check if user A can access data of user B or something, but don't try to yeah, <laughs> get all the data from the server. And also if you accidentally like see something once, just don't save it, don't run any analysis on it. It's just like, that's the moment when you stop touching it. Just don't do anything there. And ideally just avoid such research methods. So as soon as you think this might harm user privacy, just don't do this. And that's the thing here. So if you found a severe data leakage, it's really, yeah, sometimes it's easier to pretend it didn't happen, but then again, you want to be a good faith security researcher. You want to report this, you want to get this fixed. And that means that you have to include third parties idly from the very beginning. And usually you would report such a leakage over BSI in Germany. And this might save you a little bit from legal trouble because then it's already like an external regulation party um, that is involved into this and will, will help you a bit. Uh, you can even send something to BSI Anonymous if you are not sure about what you're doing. Uh, still a possibility here. And because of all those uncertainties so that you're not liable for what you're reporting, you should report a bug in a way that does not give the other company uh, like something that could compromise you. So you should avoid statements on your research methods like I did reverse engineering, I decompiled this and that. If it's not explicitly allowed, just don't put that in your report. You should submit a minimal proof of concept, but it shouldn't reveal all the information that you have. So. There are some exceptions, so there are some programs where you can submit a fuzzer and then you even get a bounty for the fuzzer. But in most cases, just send a minimal proof of concept and that's it. And then make it easy to uh, have your results validated by a non-expert. So it might be the case that there's just a help desk person or so that's receiving all the reports and maybe just the secretary who checks the email also gets the security reports. So clearly state the impact, like what is the issue, um, attach some proofs and logs and screenshots. And sometimes, especially like when it's web-based or when it's something that can be fixed easily by the vendor, then also make a video of this. And then there is also some more stuff, like if you want to uh, push them a bit into like fixing something, a usual disclosure deadline would be 90 days. But especially for small companies, my experience is that uh, already just like somehow getting it fixed is complex. So at least you should get a first response and maybe even some triaging in the first two weeks. And you should request like, how is it going and so on. I wouldn't enforce the 90 days too aggressively. In some cases it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it really depends on the target you're looking at. And now to the next part, ethics. So you are probably most of you IT security students at TU Darmstadt. And I think that's a part that during my studies was not sufficiently discussed. So uh, if you think it's boring and watching this like remote on YouTube, you can skip it. But as a student, you now have to also watch this part. Because the reason is you found a critical bug and now like what is next? 
it's all just about finding bugs here and sometimes about like i don't know you become a CISO or something but there's very rare discussion like what is ethical to do once you found a critical bug so of course you could just like report the bug to the vendor and then send a simple bug report maybe even crash only crashing at a funny program counter or something and that might be sufficient and then you get your bug bounty maybe not that also might depend on the quality of the proof of concept but yeah it depends um, and then you get a comparably small amount of money, a few thousand dollars. I mean, that's still a lot for a student, but it's not so much for someone who tries to make a living out of bug bounty. So if you try to report bugs and then live from the bounty, that's tough. And then ideally you get a CVE. I think as a student, you should call this a CV enhancer. So a number that you can put on your CV and tell people, hey, I found a uh, high impact bug and then in the end with the cv you will probably get a well-paid job and some reputation and so on now the alternative to this is you can make a lot 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 more money you sell the exploit either because yeah you just sell it to an exploit broker or maybe you have a job at a governmental secret agency or something and they develop exploits and these exploits are not just meant to a proof of concept that crashes somewhere, but they are meant to run reliably on a victim device. That means you have to chain vulnerabilities, you need to weaponize them, you make it fast and reliable. So, for example, there are some competitions like Pwn to Own, where you have three attempts and each of them five minutes to exploit a target, but this is really not enough for real world exploit because if you have only 99% rel reliability and the other ones produce a crash, that means the crash report is then being sent to the vendor or like, for example, Apple or Google automatically in many cases. And this means that it will be discovered, it will be burned, it will be fixed. So you cannot really have this for a long time. So reliability is really key to such an exploit. It really shouldn't be detected at the victim device or at the vendor. And then for a good exploit, you would get a lot of money once, but at least, yeah, you had probably a lot of development time before. So the question is if it still pays off, but probably it still does. And then afterwards, because it's not necessarily legal to sell it or it also depends like how you sell it and so on but you will probably never talk about it again at least not about the exploit details you can still try to maximize your bug bounty so you can be on this bug bounty site but not directly report to the vendor but use some broker in between and the idea is that they verify your report and then only send it to the vendor so the quality at the vendor side is much higher and the broker in between they profit from knowing the exploit internals early on like they could build i don't know antivirus signatures or like try to look at the exploit technique to fix it earlier and so on and for example point to own and the zero day initiative they have something like this where you can um yeah just get a higher bounty under certain circumstances more like a competition in point to own or a zero day initiative who organizes this they also have a program where you can just send in any vulnerability and have this as a mode so in the end the vendor would still know what the bug is and could fix it and sometimes there's also like temporary bounties so google had a trick and treat at Halloween last year, where you could get up to 50k dollars just for a Linux kernel zero day if it was also using a new exploitation technique. And there are no programs out there, so just check what applies to your target. Maybe there is something that would get you a higher bounty than usual. And well, if someone is sitting on a zero day and don't want to sell it like to exploit brokers for a ethical reason or so, they might just wait until it has like more value but of course someone else could find the same vulnerability so you never know it's a bit risky um, and also for example point to own regularly changes the targets so it might be that you are developing an exploit and then the next year where you would like to uh, compete there 
the target is no longer on the list. Now, the alternate way is that you don't try to fix the bug and get some money as a bug bounty, but that you just sell it for like having an exploit that's being used against real world targets. And that is the price list. So for example, Zerodium is having this price list public. There might also be other exploit yeah, vendors or like they, they, yeah, they trade it uh, in some ways. So this is something that you can of course do. Please note on the left hand side, it, it just says up to. So if your exploit is not really reliable or whatsoever, they might discuss that they are not going to buy this. It might also be the case that they say, oh, local privilege escalation to system. We already have, I don't know, 10 over here of this type and pin bypass also. So it, it doesn't really matter. We don't buy this currently. So this can just happen. But yeah, so that's the price. It's much more money still if they say it's not worth the full up to amount. Um, so why would you not just sell to Zerodium? That's really a big question because you could make more money. And that's very now we're talking a bit about the dangers of exploits. So an exploit is something that's really meant to harm the target. So it runs on a device and it's not really noticed. And this is then being done to, yeah, for example, break confidentiality. So breaking privacy, but not just of normal users, but usually targets here are politicians, journalists. So it's really uh, important to like know where they go, what they report, what is next to maybe even stop them doing something. And next part is integrity. So if someone was on a system, nothing stored there is like under control anymore. So they could manipulate a device like stuff that is on the device, but they could also send messages in the name of another person. And of course, availability. So probably that's in most cases not so important, but if critical infrastructure is the target, then it could really be something that harms, directly harms people. And of course, an exploit, it, yeah, circumvents technical measures. That means the victim will not notice that this happens. So you have this breach of confidentiality, integrity and availability and nobody really knows why it happens. So even if you're attacking critical infrastructure with an exploit, you don't really know if it was like a technical defect or was it like malware or was it like an organized crime? You really will not know this in the end. And this is why exploits have a lot of regulations. So the idea is, yeah, okay, we have exploit, but we have also legal measures to just yeah, prevent that something falls into the wrong hands and we have a lot of oversight. And so we have control. And because of this, there is the Vazna arrangement and also some export controls in the European Union. And they are just saying, okay, if there's dual use goods, if there's weapons and stuff, uh, then this applies and not everyone should be able to sell it to everyone else. So it's highly regulated under which conditions you could still sell and buy such a thing. And in the European export controls, there is intrusion software defined. And this means anything that avoids detection by monitoring tools or defeats protective countermeasures. And yeah, then down there, it's also defined what that is. So a monitoring tool is, for example, a firewall already or an intrusion detection system. And something that is a protective countermeasure is already sandboxing or ASLR. So pretty simple measures, and it already counts as intrusion software if they are bypassed. Now, the next thing is that because, apply, apply, uh, because exploits will not be noticed, uh, probably it will not be noticed. So um, you don't have a crash, you don't have traces on the target. And even if the victim would notice the usage of an exploit, it's hard to attribute, like who launched the attack? 
everyone will say, no, we didn't do this. We have no idea and so on. And this secrecy is actually needed in some cases. So for example, in the US, there are FISA courts who are responsible for allowing exploit usage against other targets. And the court hearings are held secretly because of course the victim should not know like which information was gathered when and where and so on. But that means it's also relatively easy to reduce and exploit without consequences. And if this is possible, then it's also relatively easy to abuse exploits without consequences. So once you give it away, you have no control over your vulnerability anymore. So there's a lot of known abuse with exploits. For example, uh, the first link here, that's really something I would recommend to you listening to because it's a long article, but you can also just listen to an hour of recording where someone reads it out. And it's about all recent things by Citizen Lab and by NSO and so on. And they also uncover a new exploit that has been used against WhatsApp where 1,400 individuals were um, uh, yeah, information extraction from their smartphone took place. So this is something you can just look into and like government officials were attacked like the UK, but also France and so on. So there's many, many targets there. And then there's the second one that is also mentioned in, in the first one, but a bit shorter. So that the second link is just a part of this. Um, also from, yeah, when you're watching this last week, currently it's this week. So that's really recent stuff. Uh, so this one is about Catalans, which have been targeted like all, um, presidents and former presidents back to 2010, but also a lot of other Catalans and also their relatives. So not just, uh, directly the people, but everyone. And here the issue is like, people think, okay, you, you only say, sell the spyware like to dictators or like don't sell it to dictators. So it cannot be abu abu uh, abused anymore. So that's the idea of it. And so we only sell spyware to democracies. So, but this in the end means that probably it's still getting abused. So because who was attacking the Catalans, probably Spain. I mean, there is no proof that Spain did this. But again, that's probably the most likely attribution here. And there's also in the past have been cases where it's pretty clear that it was a democracy and they were um, using this and it fell into the wrong hands, so to say. So once you have like some spyware or some exploit and it's purchased, it's not really a question of like if abuse is going to happen, but when even if there is a democracy. There's much more known abuse. Another famous case is just linked first and there is uh, Jamal Khashoggi and his murder was linked to the usage of NSO spyware. So this argument that some intrusion software is not killing people did not hold anymore. And that's also the reason why some people left the company developing the spyware back then. Then the second one uh, is about dark matter. And here there were operatives who didn't know who they were targeting. So this can also be the case. You think you're developing spyware for the good, but in the end you aren't. And then I also have a link to another case where it was detected that um, exploits were used against a minority group in China. So you never know what something is being used against once you sell it. So we have kind of this uh, two axes here, like some stuff is right to do, some is wrong to do, some stuff is illegal to do, and some stuff is legal to do. And of course, some people say, hey, we have some, I don't know, we don't like certain politicians or certain projects or something, and they just start hacking this, and they feel like they are doing something right. Um, but in the end, it's not legal what they do. So they are not talking to the police. They are doing this secretly. 
And uh, this is, yeah, nothing that we are doing like here in the lab. Then there's also some stuff that's not really controversial, but it's clearly illegal, like stealing credit card information. There's no reason for this being done uh, in a right and legal way. Then sometimes stuff you do is legal. So there's a law that says you can do this, but in the end you see like, for example, spyware being abused and so it's still wrong what you do, even though it's legal. And of course, we want to be in this top right corner where we get bug bounty and are like happy and, and everything is nice and legal. So please stay there. So consider that what you do is right and is legal. Now, next I'm showing some project proposal example so that if you uh, are working on a project during the semester, have an idea like what to do, what is in scope, what is out of scope. So first of all, you want to probably do security testing or most of you. So you have to choose something that's like technical possible, but also legal. You should avoid remote web APIs because of this, because you have yeah, privacy of other users and like also service disruption is a risk. And also there are a lot of interfaces that you could still look into if you have an application. So they are probably fine. So you could look into messengers, they get data from other users. And of course, some of this goes through the web, but you can instrument the app locally to not even require any web for testing. Then there's data being exchanged between IoT devices. Maybe you want to look into this and there might even be a bug bounty program for IoT. That's quite often the case. Maybe you want to look for privilege escalation or something else that's just pre-installed on a system. And you can also directly look into a system, for example, wireless demons, they parse raw packets like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, the baseband, and there's always bugs in there that are security critical. Especially when it comes to operating systems, then it's usually covered by a security reporting program that has a bug bounty. And uh, yeah, probably if you have, um, a target that is too large, then you can still try to yeah, adapt it to the scope. So you say you just test for fewer attacks. So in the end, it should also be suitable for beginners. If your target is like way too big, then probably already reducing the scope is not a thing. So it, it just depends. But in many cases, just saying we test fewer things is totally fine. You're not doing a pen test where like everything has to be tested in the end. There might also be non-security targets because, uh, yeah, interfaces are really interesting. So if you have a closed source messenger and want to have it interoperable with an open source messenger, or if you have IoT gadgets, they have an open source app or not yet an open source app. You want to have them an open source app for a fitness tracker or something. This is really interesting for analyzing interfaces and European law has some exceptions that even allowed to look into something for interoperability reasons. So there's more explanation there. There's still restrictions. So you cannot do everything just for interoperability, but you can do a few things that are allowed under those circumstances. And even if you are not looking for security, if you understand an interface, the messages that go through it and maybe also the way how integrity and confidentiality, everything is checked, you might find security vulnerabilities. And so you should still have a disclosure plan in, in case something happens and you find a security bug. Something that's really cool that you can do is if you have such an interface, you could re-implement one end of the protocol or even both ends. And this is a high effort. So I would only recommend this for a nine CP project or like a thesis, or if you're working in a group, but still, this is something that's really, really nice. And many users like the outcome of such projects. Now, estimating the scope is really difficult. Like it, what we are doing here is not like a CTF. There is no solution um, that is intended. So probably there are easy solutions. Sometimes there is no solution. There is no back guarantee for what you are doing. And sometimes there are weird dependencies that you never thought about. So for example, Apple has a lot of mechanisms where they enforce that you're using a physical device. 
so I think I haven't checked it, but I think I read somewhere that iMessage is linked in a way that you can only use it on a physical iPhone and not, or like a physical Apple device and not just any device. And this difficulty in the end, you will see like, okay, this was really a hard project. I had to do a lot. I, I just, yeah, I got stuck somewhere, um, but you don't know this in advance because yeah, there is no assigned difficulty to this. And a few things might already matter a lot, like the underlying programming language or compiler options or something. Uh, if something is a Flutter app, it's probably very hard to reverse engineer compared to something that's just written in Objective-C, but that's nothing that you would immediately see. It takes like a little bit of testing initially. And that's the reason why you should load your target binary into Ghidra and try to hook it with Frida as early as possible. If there is some time today, you can already do this. And otherwise we do it in the next lecture just to see some stuff as early as possible and maybe switch project if something doesn't work out. I have a bunch of research hardware, so I'm mostly working on mobile phones. So I have a bunch of iPhones, also a few Google Pixels and Samsungs. So if you want to look into mobile apps, that's really an option here. Um, something else that you can do is uh, we have some laptops. If you want a laptop for security research, you should really argue why you want one because um, we don't have so many. So if you say I want to do some fuzzing that really needs an M1 processor or something, that's probably a reason. And we have IoT devices. We can also buy IoT devices short term. So if you say I have like this and that thing that I just want to analyze, then I can just order this within a week. That's also pretty easy. Then there is software defined radios. So we have many hacker apps. If you just want to look into something wireless, that's really easy here. It's, we are like a wireless lab. Um, and of course, maybe you just don't need any hardware. So you can just use a virtual machine. That's also, that's good for me. So I don't have to do like all the hardware borrowing and so on. Um, so if you want something or like need something for your project, state why you need this and we will try to make this possible. If you're new to reverse engineering, there's one thing that I recommend, which is analyzing iOS apps. It's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but it's the one that I'm the most familiar with. So um, I can help you the most. Of course, if you have a group of people who say like, yeah, but I did a lot of Android reversing before, or I don't know, I have this Linux thing that I want to look into, that's totally fine. But uh, just as a recommendation for those who are really new here. And now I have an example, uh, just something that you could also write into your project proposal, but uh, please just don't copy a signal messenger, just come up with your own idea. Um, so signal is open source. That means if I decompile the app, to retrieve the original source code. That's not a copyright infringement. And so I can analyze it also with the same methods as reverse engineering. I can use Ghidra, I can use Frida and so on, but it's still a non-trivial target. So it has a really, really huge code base. And you should also be uh, careful with third party libraries. So maybe it includes something that you are not allowed to decompile. The bug reporting is so so. So, if you find a small issue, you can just uh, open an issue on GitHub. If you find a really critical bug, then you should report it using a special email address, but there is no bug bounty. And many people have looked into it before. So, maybe there's not so much to find, but maybe just the sheer size means that you will find bugs. So the next part would be to collect some attack ideas. Since this is now not in person, there is some feedback missing, but otherwise I would now ask you like what you think could be attacks on Signal. And here I'm just collecting a few. So for example, there might be some message rendering vulnerabilities, something that gets rendered in weird ways if you send it, um, or 
the underlying database. It's uh, SQLite, I think. So maybe you can do SQL injection or something weird. Also, there's message synchronization between multiple devices. I don't know how that works and if that has security implications. Um, also, the user interface maybe has like uh, weird things that it shouldn't do. Uh, or there is missing security enforcement when you block users and so on. I think there's also a mode where you have like special pins for uh, yeah something locked on the uh, signal server, but also I think to unlock your signal locally. I don't know how that works. Maybe you could browse identities of people who are using signal because of the phone numbers. Maybe there's parsing issues in sticker packs. Maybe there's something in the like video call. So you can have a video audio call either to have exploitation, but maybe you can just do a silent call where you just like you call someone and you hear something uh, without them actually accepting the call and so on. So there's tons of possibilities what you could analyze in, in Signal. And that's also the issue here. Like it's probably too much what just like a single six credit point or nine credit point project. But if you are working in a group, then it's probably fine. And also just try to make a complete list and then try to find something that interests you. And if this fails, then you have still a bunch of other things just to analyze later on. So something that I really like to do for open source projects is like browsing GitHub issues or for others, you can look at HackerOne security reason or something else, or maybe even if there's not much known about your target, you can see if you find people on LinkedIn working for a company and you might find some technologies being used. Um, yeah, so here you see one report where someone says like they blocked users, but you are still like getting message notifications from them. And then there's another one that's really fun, I think. Um, so you can basically create a group, but with the same name and picture as a contact has set. And uh, yeah, it, it's just, it's weird because you really can no longer distinguish the chats. And uh, yeah, so this one is a lot of fun, but they also didn't consider it a security issue, even though that's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, from a UI perspective, uh, really, really bad design. So something that you can also do is try to find public security research also because of the disclosure timeline and so on, but also to see what has been tested so far. I would also like if there was, uh, yeah, more tradition to uh, also publish negative results, like someone tested something and they didn't find anything, but this is rather uncommon, except from like, if there is a security certification and someone passed all the tests, then this is published, but um, there's probably a lot of security research not being published. Anyway, these are just two examples. So WebRTC, which is the video call thing has been exploited. And also you can just enumerate all signal users by their phone number. And probably there's like even more. I just didn't look into this for too long. So next I'm doing a short demo of the first steps, how to look into signal apps and how to do basic analysis. So we will just dump and decrypt the iOS app using a tool, unpack it, and then look into it with Gitra and also with Frida just to see if this works. And this is a very critical part. So if it doesn't work, it means probably you chose a target that is hard to reverse engineer. And we will just try to, uh, yeah, check this like later on today, if you want for targets that you thought about but you will also learn the details of doing this on your own in the next lecture. So don't be afraid. This is just to show you like some essential things that should be there to reverse engineer an app easily and not to have like a very complex target that is hard to reverse engineer. What you can see here is just a normal Mac OS, but you can also do this on Linux. Um, and I also show you my display of my iPhone. So this iPhone is actually jailbroken. Uh, so I have the uncover 
uh, jailbreak on it. And so I'm back to signal. The first task is to even get the signal app. So on most operating systems, you can just download this. And here on iOS, it's like, it's really different. So the app store has encrypted applications that you have to dump while the app is running. Um, otherwise it's encrypted and you cannot analyze. So we need to have a jailbroken iPhone in the first place. Afterwards, it gets a lot easier because typically there are not so many uh, prevention mechanisms in it against traversing, but the first step are really <laughs> not so nice. All right, so the Frida iOS Stumper, you can just git clone a repository here. Uh, that's this one that I just uh, cloned, Frida iOS Stump. Um, all right, and if you have this, you will have this nice Stumper script. Um, there's a bit more in the readme because there's one more thing that you need to get running, which is SSH, because it actually accesses some stuff via SSH on the phone. For this, we need to forward the SSH port on the iPhone locally to our device with iProxy, and we need to have an authorized key, the default password, which is Alpine, or you need to provide the password and key with some parameters here. So I just start iProxy in the background. That's sufficient. And now what else? Um, dump, no, uh, Python 3, run the dumper, script, first arguments. So arguments are some SSH stuff here that we can ignore. Um, and we could list all applications, but we just want to dump signal. Signal has to be running in the foreground while doing this. And all I do now is I say signal. This is now really going to take a moment because signal is a huge app. It has a lot of different frameworks included. Here you need to take care because they could be closed source. Um, not everything included has to be open source, but yeah, so that's the main idea. So we don't need my iPhone right now, but you know, so you can just see the dumping. We have the iPhone application, which is now in one file. This is a zip file. So basically you can just go there um, and look into the file. So I just say here, Uh, many, many things inside, many settings inside. The main application is just here uh, in payload, signal app, and then you have again many files, but this is just the signal executable. So this is the main executable that we are going to look into. There are probably many more things inside that you can have a look at, but so far, like this is the first step. And now I switch to Ghidra. So in Ghidra, you can just include this signal file. So the main app within the app, you can say import file for this specific file. And then it's here. I already did this because the analysis runs quite long. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I even stopped in between because uh, I, I didn't want to wait for too long. But yeah, here we have it. I could even continue the analysis. I just would say auto analyze signal, um, but I think it found enough to, to see um, that we have some symbols here. So if you have an app that has no symbols at all, then everything would just like be called function, 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 and get a number. Uh, but here we have many things with names, and you can also see on the right hand side, we have a bunch of things with names. Actually, most stuff has a name here already from the analysis. You can also see the main function here, for example, um, looks pretty good. You can see there's some Swift and Objective-C stuff going on. 
and this really does not read nice. So um, this is the reason why I prefer dynamic analysis a lot on iOS because Objective C has a runtime uh, where you can see all object calls, including the, the parameter knives and everything. So it becomes more readable if you don't use Ghidra here. But for now, uh, that's it's it's sufficient. So we can just see everything. Um, and we know, okay, the app is not encrypted anymore. We can get it. There is no jailbreak detection because otherwise it wouldn't even start up. Looks good. And now to the dynamic instrumentation, <laughs> which might be a bit more fun. Let's see. Uh, I would probably go even one level higher here. Uh, and then I can just use free that trace uh, via USB. So that's the minus U. And then I just say M, that's Objective C uh, methods. And I know that's way too much, but I can just like try here um, everything that has something with message in it, no matter what argument, parameter names, I just trace it. And in the signal app, and I also open the signal app because who knows, like if it's too much load, it might crash already. And we might also see some artifacts uh, just from tracing sometimes. As you can see, there are a lot of functions with something with message. If I go back to Ghidra while this is running, um, and if I type, type message here, I mean, there's, yeah, also quite some functions, right? But who? <laughs> not as many as uh, we are tracing over here. Okay, and here we got an interesting uh, error. I don't know why this happens in this version, but basically in the NSXPC interface proxy library, um, there is now an UI view something something, uh, and this actually calls, uh, causes us to crash because the name is too long. I don't know. <laughs> so no idea why this happens, but I just exclude it here because it's, it's, it's a problem. So I'd say minus M, so let's exclude. The other one includes. Um, not sure if intuitive, but uh, yeah. So I just exclude this thingy here. Mm. And trace signal again. Sorry that this takes so long, but it shows already how large signal is. So it's much more than you would expect from a single messenger. <laughs> okay, this looks like it succeeded. It hangs a bit for a moment and now we see many, many things. Let's just press Ctrl C again, hoping that this is like, <laughs> still not at the point where the app crashes looks good so the issue here is that we have this um thing here with message and that's definitely not related to sending a message um i don't know and it's this copy with so and so it's copying something so i would just exclude the copy with so and it might be that we miss something if i just say Everything that does a copy with zone is excluded. Um, but if there is too much instrumented, then the target app might just crash. So copy with zone something and do this again. So it's really a bit <laughs> tedious um, just to see like if something is traceable easily. So at this point, we already know like there's symbols in it. We can trace it. That looks pretty good, but I just want to show like a few more steps maybe. Okay. Might work in a moment. 
I think we have to exclude a few more things. Copy message info. Yeah, that's also too much. Um, so I exclude this as well. Um, I think this time I just say everything from this object could again be the wrong decision. Um, but yeah. Okay. I think that's just the handle generation. Okay, 23,000 functions being traced. Still a bit, but it looks, yeah, it doesn't scroll like crazy. So I can start typing. Okay, so that's maybe something already. Nice, okay, so you can just scroll in, in this and see a few things. So um did the log message who knows maybe it's cool to see log messages here i'm not sure if that's possible um and then i'm apparently creating an outgoing messages um update with some recipient was sent by and so on so i'm just creating one and updating it apparently all the time maybe i mean maybe it's also a bit weird um it's not even sent, but it's like doing the send locally. So I don't know, maybe it's saving it in the drafts. Um, now I'm just sending this and you see a lot of more things going on. Um, probably you would need to blacklist way more functions to, to get a good understanding of what is going on. Um, yeah, scrolling here a bit. but that's the, the principle of how it works. So you can just start tracing and this really looks like you're, yeah, not just seeing source code, but really uh, things happening here. Uh, so yeah, just try what you want. Like, I don't know, um, but this looks pretty much doable, except from that it's, really really large <laughs> uh, but that's okay so i mean it basically means that you need to spend more time uh, and that you need to uh, find a focus early on so that's it with the demo and now i have a few more tasks all right so in this initial analysis we have seen like many 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 things uh, so the signal app is really really huge probably larger than you expected it's written in objective c and also easy to instrument with frida if you look into github you see it's not just objective c but also swift so it's a combination of the two but swift calls a lot into objective c and you can do a lot of manipulation easily there's also a swift bridge being under development for frida so it's probably something that will be easier in the future. And there's many, many attack vectors, many open issues. So there's probably still a lot to find. And yeah, the signal app is so huge that the last 10 updates were just about it getting 25% smaller each time. So hopefully when uh, you see this presentation, the signal app is maybe like down to one megabyte, but I don't think so. I think it's just an issue here. Anyway, I brought you some exercises that you can now do. And the first one is a very yeah short task. So you just try to find suitable apps or targets. So just search for two or three of them and then check if they are legal to reverse engineer, check 
if they are interesting from a security or interoperability perspective. And ideally, as I said, like it shouldn't have like any jailbreak root detection. It should not have any obfuscation. And we can check for this if time allows already today and otherwise like next week. And once you're done with this, I will probably give you like 10 minutes or so. Everyone uh, should like show these apps here. Now it's not here because it's not in person, but uh, yeah, later on. And then it would just be probably like one minute per app just to discuss like here is an app and it's open source so it's legal and it's still very complex or you say it's closed source but it has a bug bounty program that allows reverse engineering and so on and then preparations for the next time please download gitra and install it the java setup is a bit weird so you have to double check that you not just downloaded it but also that you can run it and if you want you can also download the ida freeware and the binary ninja demo or like maybe you have them already purchased that's probably even better at least the binary ninja is not too expensive for students and you can also install frida on linux so uh, if you have linux running that's easy you just type in a bunch of commands if not then please set up a linux vm because we have one exercise next time so i have just a simple vm set up in the next two slides. So what you do is you can use Vagrant and VirtualBox and just build a VM automatically. That's pretty simple to do with this configuration file. If you don't do this, you can just install the packets that I listed here in, in orange. So that's also an option. And then on macOS, you might get a VM startup failure. So you'd need to give it permissions uh, and reboot your Mac. That's a bit weird and not that obvious, so I just have it on the slide. And then you have a task until the next time, which is the project proposal. So please just write down one or two pages in a PDF. So it doesn't have to be super uh, long, but just to describe the project that you want to do and hand it in via Moodle. And next time I will just give you feedback on this. If we have hardware for this already, if I need to get hardware, um, maybe you just have something that runs on, on Windows or Linux for reverse engineering, and then you can just use your own hardware. That's also easy here. And some projects uh, might be interesting, some might not be interesting. So maybe we will reassign some groups. So maybe someone has a proposal for something that's really a lot of work and so on. But please, for now, for this uh, hand-in, just uh, write your own proposal, every person with a different project. And in the end, we can have a variety to choose from. And I have a few more resources linked here. There will be more in the upcoming lectures. So first of all, there's Android stuff. So there's the Android platform security model. If you want to learn about Android, that's a rather short paper compared to all the information that's in there. And there's also uh, an app reverse engineering 101 uh, publicly with some exercises by Maddie Stone. There's also a very good mobile security course, but it mostly covers Android, but you can look into this. For iOS, there's not so much. So there's an official security guide by Apple uh, that you can look into. It describes like all the security concepts in a high level uh, perspective, but not so much in detail how it's implemented. And I have myself some YouTube videos online on my channel that are about yeah, free diverse engineering and iOS. And of course, we are using Frida a lot in this lab. So you can look into the Frida documentation and especially the JavaScript API. Um, and maybe you also find some examples online using Frida that are related to what you want to look at. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching. And uh, yeah, there's no real Q&A because it's not in person, but you can, of course, comment to the video.